bankruptcy. A stunning fall. Major restructuring. Debt is piling up. Companies are filing for bankruptcy now at the fastest rate since 2020. Bed Bath & Beyond filed this year, Party City filed, Vice Media, Instant Pot and Pyrex, the list really goes on. And by all counts, there's more to come. The stakes are high, jobs are on the line. Debt growth. Credit crunch. Ouch. Debt defaults like this tend to come in cycles like in 2008. We're in the midst of a serious financial crisis. Or the start of the pandemic when Washington stepped in, slashing interest rates so that companies on the brink could get cheap money. We saw company after company taking on more and more debt. All this access to debt bought companies time, but it also kicked the can down the road. Nobody knows how long the pain will last. We are prepared to raise rates further if appropriate and intend to hold policy at a restrictive level. The record surge in interest rates is at the root of the issue. Global companies have borrowed more than $500 billion of investment-grade debt since the Fed's rate hikes began in 2022. The vast majority of this was heaped onto U.S. balance sheets. And despite the high borrowing costs, debt continues to grow. It's really been building over the course of the last year. Interest rates have increased, cash flows have declined. By mid-2023, blue chip names saw their borrowing costs rise by more than double to an average of 5.6%, while junk-rated companies were paying 8.7%. With rates potentially staying high for a longer period of time, we could see a longer cycle that may not necessarily be tied to the macro economy. The problem is in part that this is a little bit by design. The Federal Reserve wants to slow down inflation. Interest rates were kept higher for longer than a lot of economists and people on Wall Street expected. Bye. This higher rate environment has created a mountain of distressed debt. Distressed debt is generally bonds. They are tradable. Bonds that originally sold for 100 bucks are selling for 20 bucks or 15 bucks or five. There's more than $200 billion of distressed debt in the US, and that's more than the GDP of some European countries. Since 2021, this sort of debt, owed by riskier, less creditworthy businesses, has jumped around 400%. Retailers are especially vulnerable. Inflation keeps their costs high, even as consumer spending slows. By mid-2023, the consumer industry accounted for more than a fifth of bankruptcy filings. Most bankruptcies don't occur because you have a business and it loses money. A business borrows money, times get tough, and when it goes to refinance that loan, the bank says, you're not as good a credit as you used to be, or we don't have as much money to lend as we used to have, or our standards are higher. The hope in bankruptcy is that the doors are kept open, everyone is kept employed, but we're seeing more and more liquidations, which basically means that all of the stores need to be shut down. For consumer-facing companies and those upstream supplying them, that will impact their businesses. So you can kind of have this domino effect, and that can have huge impacts on communities. And those can be pretty difficult, particularly if they have a lot of space. Retailers use bankruptcy to get out of leases without having to pay large sums of money to the landlords. Which leads us to commercial real estate. Remote work plus online shopping have helped increase vacancies. Unlike home loans, commercial real estate mortgages typically range from five to 15 years. And across the United States, almost 1.5 trillion worth of commercial real estate debt is due before 2025. We're already starting to see some major real estate firms default on their buildings. The big impact for cities is the downtown central business districts. Another potential victim of mounting debt is healthcare, one of the most distressed industries in the U.S., in part because the sector's relative stability made it so attractive to private equity. Private equity goes in and buys these companies with debt, in part because they don't have to put up their own cash for it. They can basically transfer the debt to the company, but as a result, the company needs to be making enough profit, not just to pay off that debt, but also to have enough returns and lucrative returns for those investors. As of 2023, private equity owned 30% of the country's for-profit hospitals, which means these hospitals are forced to prioritize achieving sustainable profits instead of just focusing on community needs and public health. 
The tech industry has its own pressures, mainly because most startups are unprofitable and depend on cheap financing. The appetite for risk has declined a bit. There is less capital available to companies, particularly those that are growing. Higher rates make these new tech companies less attractive because investors want to see proof of profits immediately. Big companies respond by cutting jobs to reduce costs. Small companies struggle to raise funding. Typically, when a tech company goes bankrupt, it's a product failure. It's a technology or an idea failure. You know, it just kind of goes poof. Playing into the consolidation of tech and some other industries is the collapse of local lenders like Silicon Valley Bank, Signature, and First Republic. All were seized by the FDIC and had their assets sold off and their demise reduced credit availability. A daily battle is being waged in supermarkets all over this country. From the post-war economic boom in the 1950s to its high point in the 80s, interest rates have always fluctuated with the times. But the near zero rates of the last 15 years following the great financial crisis have hardly been the norm. The financial crisis was obviously unique in and of itself. This time around, banks are much healthier. When it's difficult to raise money, clearly many more companies are going to founder. Fortunately for companies on the brink, this time the fall doesn't seem quite so far. It's definitely not as dire as 2008. It's not even on the same scale. The problem is, when companies aren't put off by higher rates and keep borrowing, it may be a sign that the Fed still has more work to do to bring down inflation, which increases the odds that someone will get caught off sides and left to take the hit.